Hi everybody, Craig from Arms and Armor here today. We're going to talk a little bit about a question we got on one of our more recent videos that we did. Uh, a guy was asking some questions about guards and how did they form, what, what are the different elements do for them. So we thought we'd just talk real quick about what a sword guard actually is and how it functions. Um, one of the things that is interesting about sword guards is they evolve over time. But in many cases, you will see different variations of styles uh, across greater time strengths than we think. Um, when we start adding elements to the guard, they do not all just happen in a very nice, easy, traceable development. They are kind of here, there, and everywhere. And you see things occurring over time that are very interesting and that things will come and go probably more by fashion than anything else. Uh, the way those people used the swords and what they thought of about them uh, had more to dictate about it than what was functionally going on with a lot of them. Uh, so we will just do a quick overview of what does a sword guard accomplish. One, it's there to keep your hand from, one, sliding down onto the blade probably, but also to help protect your hand. Now when we start with a Roman Gladius, you can see there's not a lot of guard there really at all. There is just this wasted hump of uh, wood that creates a nice solid grip for your hand so that you can use the sword functionally, you can use the levering of your hand against those pieces. But it is not going to be there to protect you in a great deal with somebody cutting at your hand. This illustrates one of the most important points of sword combat is you don't stick your hand out there to get hit. Uh, your sword hand will be going forward. It's going to be using the attacking advantages of the particular weapon you're using, but a lot of people will get sniped on the hand a lot because they have a tendency to leave their sword hand hanging out in a fight. Uh, that's not a good idea. You want to use the thrust or the strike of your sword in such a way that it, one, protects your body and yourself and hopefully your hand, and some of the elements that you get to see added to the sword enhance that. Uh, so we start with a, something very simple like that, and then uh, when we go to like a medieval sword, we begin to see that grip is now in steel, right, or iron, and has been extended out. It has grown uh, quite wide in this particular case. Some of them are a bit shorter, say on a Viking style sword or something. But you can see that this now has the ability to create an L shape to help protect you in a way when you close off a line in an attack with a sword. Um, these can also be used offensively to strike with. Uh, you see that illustrated in some cases. And the amount of material in this is not great, but it does add a little bit of weight and oomph to the sword itself and allows you to uh, protect your hand a little better, especially if you would be wearing gauntlets. This would be a very effective uh, hand protection uh, with the gauntlet added to it. Now, uh, these types of swords are going to be the predominant throughout the Middle Ages. They are going to see where it's just a straight guard, runs no shaping to it really, just a tapered out to the side. Uh, very effective, very simple, easy to do. It's just a bar of steel with a hole in it so that the tang and the rest of the sword can be attached on the other side. Uh, when that tang passes through the guard itself, it allows uh, you to compact the hilt components and do other things there. That's what's gonna hold the piece together as a sword. But they start to change that guard a little bit. So we see, like in the case here of our Durr, that the sword has an S shape to the guard, right? So in your dominant hand, it'll have a tendency to S curve and be used to allow you a little more protection so that when I've got the sword at an angle, it's creating a little bit more coverage of space. It's also stylistically looks good, uh, a little fancier looking maybe. So the result is that you are talking about a sword that is uh, not only being protective, but also they are striving to add something to it uh, aesthetically. But they do add a little bit to the ability of the sword to protect your hand. As we go along, you will start to see elements added to the sword, such as 
uh, here, we get a little bit further on, but there's pieces that come in prior to getting a whole hilt structure like this, okay? There's things like a nagel. We didn't have anything with a nagel on it right finished in the shop today, but I'll throw a picture up right now and you can see this is a messer with a nagel on it. This can also be done with bending things like we saw with the S-shape. This has a little S-shape to it. And you also see the beginning of where they start to add uh, staples, which are kind of U-shaped bars or rings. Uh, this has the four ring guards coming down. So you see the early development of what will later be known as kind of a rapier. Uh, oftentimes this would be done without the knuckle bowl. So it would look like that. And you see this a lot in early uh, Iberian sources, especially this being the type of sword that guys with armor were fighting with, with these finger rings and a staple. Uh, the knuckle bow gets added, of course, because when your hand is in with the sword, your knuckles are there. And if I am striking with the sword or even thrusting with the sword, that can help protect the hand and close off a line of attack completely with that sword that is now protected from the pommel all the way down, where there's nothing that can be cut. Even if I've got the sword in a grip like this, it is safe. Now, that is something that in a lot of pieces in the originals we see is very, uh, they're very light. They're not super uh, heavy or anything because they're not trying to overweight the weapon but they are relatively good at keeping those things uh, protected. One of the interesting swords we have in the Oakshot collection is this Venetian piece. And it's just a cross hilted sword with kind of a sense stopper pommel, but you can see that it's got this nice staple there. And that staple then allows a little more protection. So when the sword is here, you see there's a little more protection happening there. You see that same aspect in pairing daggers like we've talked recently where the addition of a ring on the side to your off hand so if i've got a rapier in one hand and a dagger in the other now this helps protect the outside of my hand so that when a blade makes contact and slides down it's allowing that protection to be uh, more coverage for the, the hand on the dagger. Sometimes they're quite small. This is our 1580 pairing dagger and it's kind of worked so it's got some detail to it. And you can see the arms here lift up to off the plane of the blade. This allows for some control of being able to not necessarily trap or break a blade, but to momentarily freeze it or gain control and drive it out of a line so that it opens up for your attack. These are very uh, helpful things on daggers like that, and they make your hand quite a bit safer. This all comes to the uh, culmination where you get the full on swept heel rapiers, right? Where you've got several bars and rings out here, you got bars and rings on the inside that protect the hand so that if it's out in front of me like this, it looks like it's got a lot of material protecting that hand, keeping it safe. Again, you got the knuckle bow. So this is a very effective sword for keeping the hand safe, especially when you're doing rapier play. But it again comes to that same aspect of, you don't just throw it out there and let your hand get sniped. You have to have those bars protecting your hand, the rings, the back guards, all of those are done for the protection of the hand. They try and do it so that it looks really good but they are there for protection. We got some other uh, videos and posts we've done on like the development of the rapier hilt and stuff. And I'll put some links to those below. Uh, so you can go and look at some of these in greater detail, some of the aspects of what we just talked about. And then also like the start times, when do you start, start seeing knuckle bows and things like that? Uh, those would be in those other areas. Okay, have a great day and we will talk to you soon.